guys, welcome to Hipview's History. We're hitting up the American Revolution in the next, I don't know how many minutes, because I don't plan anything. But we're gonna hit the big ideas, get most of the battles in, and see if we can blow your brain in the meantime. So whether you're a kid in school or you're just cray cray on the internet, we got a whole package of learning coming at you right now. So giddy up for that, guys, and let's go get her done. So this is a gorilla. Before we wrestle the gorilla, which we shall do and we shall win, I think we should start off with the main idea. And I think there's two big kind of themes about the American Revolution that you should know going into it. And number one, it's not a radical revolution. It's not a radical revolution in the terms of the people that are running it. It's not like the French Revolution where it's a bunch of commoners. It really is kind of the upper class, the merchant class, the you know economic elites of the continental Americas that really is trying to gain control of the economic system, the government system from a bunch of elites in Great Britain. With that being said, it's tinged with really great enlightenment kind of stuff, thanks to guys like Thomas Mitchell, who wrote books like The Crisis and uh, Common Sense, where he talked about really America being kind of the birth of a new nation where we really can shed ourselves of kind of this monarchical system. Did I say monarchical? Monarchical this kind of system of kings and queens, we could start fresh and we could really be self-governed and wrapped around these ideas of natural rights and freedom and God bless them. Um, so I think that's number one, is that um, even though we talk about all of that groovy freedom stuff, it really is more of a conservative revolution. And I think the second idea is um, something that I've taught before, it's called the M&M concept, that once you have an M&M, you want the whole darn bag. And early on in American history, colonial history, we have examples of self-government like the House of Burgesses out of Virginia, the Mayflower Compact up in the Northeast. Not to mention that no matter what type of colony you were, you had some sort of self-government that Parliament allowed us to have. You had uh, assemblies and colonial legislatures where you could elect people. And of course, it would have to pass mustard with Parliament and the King and all of that stuff. But once you have that experience in self-government and then somebody wants to take it away or somebody does something that um, isn't in line with self-government, you know, you're going to be pretty upset because you're going to want some m &Ms. So with that being said, we're going to start now, guys. Let's take it in three stages. We're going to take stage one, which is the build-up to the fighting. We'll take a look at really the beginning of the war where it didn't really go so well for a little while and then the end of the war so here we go guys let's take a look at the american revolution revolution i like saying it like the frenchman when to start I think that we could probably start with the French and Indian War, um, 1754 to 1763. The beginning of that war, it was actually Benjamin Franklin that tried to unite the colonists in order to defend themselves. This is called the Albany Plan of Union, but he had no Elmer's glue to keep us together, so that didn't work out. It's really going to take Parliament action to create that glue. So in 1763, when the French and Indian War ends, you know, Parliament kind of looks at the bill, they're like, whoa! Oh, no! Cost a lot of money to save you. So they want to do a couple things. Number one, they want to keep a standing army in the continental Americas. This is really offensive to us because, you know, at this point we're at peaceful times and having standing army is, you know, kind of like, what the hay. And the second thing they want to do is they want to raise a little cash. Oh, no. So they passed two laws in 1764, one called the Currency Act and the other called the Sugar Act, one designed to kind of get rid of uh, the way that we pay debt in Great Britain, we weren't going to be using paper money anymore, and that was upsetting to the colonists. And the other is the Sugar Act. Um, they avoided direct taxes, but they're doing it towards, you know, in the sense of raising the money through, you know, taxing sugar. And this is going to be very upsetting to the colonists. We don't like that. We sent um, Benjamin Franklin yeah. over there to raise hay in Parliament, saying that we had already spent a lot of money and this was unfair. Parliament really saying, you know, to that argument that we weren't being represented, that you were being represented. Look, a very few Englishmen voted back then, so, you know, most commoners weren't represented in the terms of they voted for somebody. They were just taken care of by Parliament and the colonies were included in that batch, so what are you complaining about? So in 1765, Parliament makes another move, and that's the Stamp Act. This is the big guy. This is the one that you want to write down. 
because this is a tax that's um, going to be applied to basically everything that the colonists use that need this special magical stamp that only Great Britain could put on it that's going to cost us a pretty penny. This to us is direct tax. This is something that we're going to handedly reject. And this is where we're going to get the Sons of Liberty. The Sons of Liberty is really the first, you know, I guess they're a terrorist group in the beginning, but eventually they're going to become the Continental Army and they start meeting outside of Boston to try to figure out acts of violence that they can do to scare the British away from doing these taxes. They end up looting and burning and tarring and feathering and committing acts of vandalism and really start organizing. I think that's one of the bigger ideas. They're responsible for the Stamp Act Congress, which met in New York City, where nine of the 13 colonies joined together, at least there, to talk about how we could have some type of response as a unified front. So, in 1766, um, a new administration in Great Britain, the Rottingham administration, takes over, and they look at the big picture, and they go, okay, look, let's back this up a little bit. Beep, beep, beep. Let's get rid of the Stamp Act. And they get rid of the Stamp Act in 1766. But then they pass another law called the Declaratory Act, which basically says, yo, look, you punk, you mind. Basically, we reserve the right to do this again. You are being virtually represented in Parliament. Not everybody votes, all right? Only a small group of people get to vote in Great Britain. You're not here. You don't get the vote. But we're thinking about you, baby. We love you. So that didn't go over very well in terms of, you know, mending this relationship or fixing the root of the problem. So in 1767, um, Great Britain takes another action. They push our buttons again with the Townsend's Act. And the Townsend Act, even though it was said to be an indirect tax, a tax on duty on essential goods, we claim that it is a direct tax, that we're not going to pay it, that you're not trying to regulate trade, you're trying to raise money, we know what you're up to. And in 1768, the Assembly of Massachusetts Bay passes a circular letter around the colonies basically asking them um, to ignore the law, to organize a formal boycott. And the king and parliament, they find out about this. They disband the Massachusetts Assembly. They're getting really riffed. They start making threats that anybody that, you know, agrees with this letter, anybody that, you know, passes anything like this, or takes action, that's treasonous, and we're going to be very upset with you, and we could try you over here and off, you know, with your head. They do that in France. and not in Huh? France, but it would be really bad, I'll just tell you that. But now the ball has been pushed. In 1769, Great Britain, seeing you know this resistance movement start to grow, sends troops to Boston. So here we are in Boston in 1770, and we have British regiments in the city. And this is not going over very well. The Sons of Liberty are organized a wonderful propaganda you know campaign that's really turning the commoners against these British soldiers. They're seen as outsiders. They're seen as invaders. And in 1770, uh, we get the Boston Massacre. And, um, some of the kids on the street were taunting some of the British soldiers a little bit, yada, 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 bang, bang, bang. Eleven people are shot, five end up dying. And even though those British soldiers um, got off, a couple were convicted of manslaughter. Actually, John Adams defended those British soldiers. It really becomes a propaganda, you know, um, bonanza for the colonists. You know, they're going to be able to spread this message, these engravings by Paul Revere of, you know, this, you know, innocent group being shot at by these British soldiers that's going to really create this divide between us and Great Britain. Now they're being seen as outsiders. So following the Boston Massacre in 1770, we really start to get the organization of a Continental Congress that's going to try to take action. In 1772, after the Gatsby Affair, where we burned down a British ship, really a big act of violence, we start um, organizing committees of correspondence, which are, I guess, going to be the enforcement arm of the Continental Congress, are going to really enforce these boycotts and really try to kick out these British governments at a local level and replace them by having state governments that are going to form the basis for this new country in the United States of America. And that's occurring really 1772, 1773, 1774, as the states are beginning to get organized. Um, in 1773, the only real tax that's left is the tea tax, and the Sons of Liberty are going to have uh, nothing to do about that. And they organize, of course, the Boston Tea Party, which is December 16, 1773. And this is really going to be something that the British are going to have to react to. So now we're going to escalate it. In 1774, the Rottingham government passes the Intolerable Acts, a set of four acts, four laws that are really going to grind it to us, going to 
um, put a little bit of gas on the fire, if you know what I mean. We're going to get the Massachusetts Government Act, which is going to limit the amount of local uh, voices and representation that we're going to be able to have. We're going to get the Boston Port Act, which is going to close the port of Boston until the, uh, you know, in today's dollars, it's something like three quarters of a million dollars where the T is paid back. The Administration of Justice Act, which is going to try British soldiers over in London. And the Quartering Act of 1774, which is going to allow the British to take our homes <laughs> over. In 1774, we react from the Intolerable Acts by creating our Provincial Congress, which is going to be the Continental Congress, which is going to start organizing the states and state governments, and we're going to start creating a Continental Army out of these militias that are being trained outside of Boston. That brings us to our first battle in February of 1775, as these new militias are being organized into a Continental Army in the outskirts of Boston. We get the Battle of Concord and Lexington, which is basically the British trying to disarm the rebels. At the same time, we're moving north. Uh, the Green Mountain Boys out of uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, under Ethan Allen, are attacking Fort Ticonderoga. Actually, most of the fighting, or the smart fighting, was actually done by Benedict Arnold, but he doesn't get any of the credit. He always doesn't get any of the credit, does he? But that's going to be a big, huge win. The British weren't guarding this humongous fort. Look at this fort. It's like the biggest fort in North America. And now we control it. So now, um, I believe that it was uh, Henry Knox is going to deliver all of that ammunition to this new forming Continental Army outside the you know, outskirts of Boston. And that's going to allow us at least to hold our ground, even though we lose the Battle of Bunker Hill, where we're really showing that we can stand up to this British Army. And that's a huge deal in terms of confidence. So, even though we lost Boston, we're going to regain it pretty quickly back in 1776, but now we have ourselves a war in 1775. So, 1776 is a very important year. Besides it being, you know, the year that we start off grand, we take back Boston, the British are nowhere to be found, we're at the Continental Congress, we're going to write this, you know, July 4th Declaration of Independence letter, everything is looking groovy, and in a sense, in our own view, it is. We form the Articles of Confederation by 1777, this kind of loose confederation of states that really is going to be one of the reasons why this war is going to last so long, because they didn't have the power to tax and raise money. It's really hard to run the Continental Army, this new army, without a real strong taxation system. But by, you know, again, July 1776, everything is looking pretty groovy, and then BAM! The British attack New York City. And this is where we get the Battle of Brooklyn. The Battle of Brooklyn is a big, huge, big, doopy dump for George Washington. Washington gets crushed in Brooklyn, and he barely escapes. Uh, General Howe, which was running the show for uh, Great Britain, really, I think, drops the ball by not really attacking George Washington and his forces more quickly. They drive him to the edge of Brooklyn Heights, and George Washington escapes like amidst the morning of fog. Like, there was this really thick fog on the morning that allowed him to get across the river to Manhattan and drive his forces out. I think Howe dropped the ball. He could have destroyed Washington. He probably could have ended the war right there and caught the whole Continental Army. But the Continental Army escapes to Manhattan. They go up the island and they split. Washington takes his forces west into Pennsylvania, and the rest of the forces are led by a gentleman by the name of General Charles Lee, who later I think we find out to be treasonous, but he's going to drive his forces north towards Canada. By the end of 1776, the only good news we have on the Washington front is this is the famous crossing of the Delaware where Washington crosses into British-held New Jersey and successfully beats the Haitian forces, which were these really mean German guys that the uh, Great Britain government sent over here as kind of hired mercenaries. And they were great for propaganda, but you didn't want to really get caught in the middle of the night with these guys around, if you know what I mean. But Washington is kind of the hero in the scenario, probably saves his job, by the way, and he's going to be now wrapped up in a stalemate in kind of Pennsylvania around Philadelphia and those middle states for quite a long time, really till 1781. Washington is kind of stuck there. That's where we get kind of these valley forges in uh, Camp Morristown where it was really bad winters, guys, with like blizzards, tons of snow, minus zero. It was really, really bad. That brings us to the northern front. General John Burgeon 
Gentleman Johnny. He's the British general that's in charge of this invasion through Canada. And the plan is, is they're going to invade through Canada and they're really going to cut off New England by taking the Hudson River and driving themselves south through Ticonderoga, through Saratoga, all the way, you know, joining with General Howe's forces in New York City. And he was supposed to reinforce Gentleman Johnny. He was supposed to send forces north from New York City, but he didn't do that. Howe decided that it would be better for him to take the rebel capital, Philadelphia, which he did for a little while. He took Philadelphia. Washington couldn't stop him. That's where Washington was you know, pushed to the outskirts of Philadelphia. And actually, Congress had to, I believe, move to York, Pennsylvania for a little while because Howe took Philadelphia. But by taking Philadelphia, he leaves Gentleman Johnny a little bit exposed up in the north. And at first, Gentleman Johnny, I'm going to call him Gentleman Johnny, did really well. He took Fort Ticonderoga, really without a battle. So one of Gentleman Johnny's mistakes was that he hired out the League of Iroquois to do some of the dirty work in the fighting in the North. And uh, Jane McCrae, her name was, ended up being scalped. And that incident, and you know, the British were horrified at this, that this lady was scalped by these Iroquois in the name of the British, you know, uh, military forces, but that was used as propaganda. And every time there's one of these incidents, whether the Boston Massacre or whether it's Jane McCrae, and there's a few more that we might talk about today, um, it's going to drive the colonists from the Loyalist camp, from people that are supporting Great Britain, into the rebel camp, into the, into the Patriot camp. And that ends up bloating the rebel forces. And we have this um, conflict in Saratoga in 1777, where Gentleman Johnny faces up against Horatio Gates. And even though Horatio Gates gets all the credit for the Battle of Saratoga and winning it, and we're gonna talk about why that's a huge battle in a second here, but guess who really is the hero? It's really Benedict. Arnold, keep hearing that name. Benedict Arnold, Arnold and a guy by the name of General Dan Morgan are really experimenting with new methods of fighting, guerrilla warfare, really using riflemen and snipers and really taking out the British that way and, you know, um, spreading them out, dispersing them and then picking them off. And it's successful. The Battle of Saratoga is a huge, huge win. And one reason why it's so important is because it's a guy by the name of Benjamin Franklin who's been waiting in Paris since the beginning of the war for this kind of news. He now can go to Versailles, he can go to King Louis, and he can say, we can win this thing. And in 1777, the British get declared war run by the French. And now, this is another huge deal, because now it's a world war. And the British can't just focus on the colonies. They have to focus on other places around the world. Not to mention John Paul Jones is launching coastal yeah. attacks in Ireland and Great Britain. they got to deal with that son of a you-know-what. But now they have to protect you know, their interest in the Caribbean. The Dutch join in. The Spanish join in. Everyone's joining in against the British. So now the British forces are being dispersed. And we really have now General Howe, who's going to be replaced by a guy by the name of Henry Clinton, which is stuck in New York City. They have like 20,000 forces in New York City, and what are they going to do? And that's going to take us to the next episode of the war. So let's take a look at the second part of the war. We now have Clinton trapped in New York City. He actually evacuates his forces from Philadelphia. He gives up the rebel capital to reinforce New York City. And actually, it's a really great story about what happens to Benedict Arnold. He actually gets appointed to be the military governor of Philadelphia. And when he goes in, he does what a lot of military governors do. They kind of take some off the top, if you know what I mean. He gets accused by uh, the governor of Pennsylvania, who wants to control Philadelphia, of graft, of corruption, of all all of these bad things, and actually blackmails George Washington into uh, canceling his military trial where he probably would have got off and extending this investigation. And that's when Benedict Arnold actually flips. Benedict Arnold's wife actually had dated a guy by the name of John Andre, who was the assistant to Clinton in New York City, and eventually was a top British intelligence officer. And Benedict Arnold at that point, you know, decided Washington's against me. You know, I didn't get any of the glory at Ticonderoga. I didn't get any of the glory at Saratoga. I got shot in the leg for God's sakes. So what
what am I going to do? I'm going to flip. Arnold wants to be the new head of West Point, which was called Fort Arnold at that point. He begs Washington for the new commission, and he gets it, and he's actually slipping secrets and blueprints and um, plans to John Andre. John Andre ends up getting caught with the blueprints, and Benedict Arnold uh, runs away. He runs away, and um, now his name is at least synonymous in the United States with traitor. If the dude had stayed, he'd probably be a hero. He'd probably be on the $50 bill. But anyway, that's the story of Benedict Arnold. John Andre, you know, for his deed of being a spy, he was hung. What? About that. So now we are in around 1778, and the British make a strategic decision to go south for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're having no um, sympathy in the north. There's no loyalists left in the north. They figure there's a whole bunch of loyalists that are down south, and there's a huge economic advantage of taking over, you know, all this cotton, all this tobacco, all of this indigo, all of this, you know, rice plantations. So they quickly, in 1778, take Savannah, Georgia, and then it takes a while, but there's a siege on Charlton um, for months, and by 1780, they're moving up the coast, and they're doing quite well. But here's the problem. The problem is, is that they're not going to be able to control really the loyalties of the citizens of these states. And every time they do something that's atrocious, they're also using Native Americans to do a lot of their dirty work. They're organizing Patriot support. And a lot of the fighting that's going on isn't between the British and the Patriots. It's between loyalists and Patriots. It's really a civil war in the South. There's a lot of vengeance, revenge going on, you know, old disputes about land land ownership, immigrants, you know, stuff like that. That's really destroying the ability of the British to get control over the southern colonies. So they begin to have to disperse from their port cities into the internal continental United States. And this is where we're going to have a humongous advantage. And guess who's going to come back? It's going to be General Dan Morgan and Morgan's riflemen that are going to be successful at really picking these guys off. Cornwallis becomes the southern general in charge. And as he's trying to get himself back to the coast, because he's getting picked off by Morgan at places like Cow Pen, some other big battles. But he's really, you know, not winning the war. It's a draw, if anything. And he's running for the coast. He's running for Yorktown. He's looking for support. He's hoping that Clinton's going to be sending him reinforcements from New York City. And he's right. The reinforcements are coming. But there is another problem. Do you know what is finally happening? That's right, the French are finally here in 1781. It took them like four years, but actually it was like hurricane season in the Caribbean. One of their uh, you know, fleets decided, what the hey, we got nothing to do, we'll go up to Yorktown, we'll help out these new Yankees, and uh, bada boom, bada bing. They, uh, at the Battle of Chesapeake, they defeat the British Navy, and now Washington's gonna be able to sweep in from the north, and um, at Yorktown, he's gonna force Cornwallis to surrender. It's gonna take another two years to get the Treaty of Paris and where the British are gonna evacuate New York City, but really, that's the end of the war in 1781. I think Washington probably wished he knew it was the end of the war because there was a lot of infighting and possible coup d'etats that were occurring during that time. There was very little money in the treasury. A lot of people weren't getting paid. But that's it. We won. The British, you know, surrender and move on. And we now, under the Articles of Confederation, can figure out what the heck we're going to do, which is probably going to have to be to write a new constitution. Let's look at some of the lessons and some of the other ideas in the revolutionary <laughs> We never really talked about it, but there's a huge contribution by African American slaves during this time period to both sides, probably more of the British. I think that, you know, people that always act in self-interest. And if you're a slave or you're a Native American, you can only see the colonists as being somebody who's not going to respect your rights. So siding with the British was pretty easy, although there were a lot of African Americans in the North that fought for the Patriots, without a doubt. But what are the big lessons? I think the big lessons are that it's really hard to fight a war from Parliament. I think that we were really lucky I think that especially in New York City, when Howe had a chance to crush Washington and that fog rolled in, I think weather played a part. 
Um, and I also think it was just miscalculations and missteps by Clinton and Howe out of New York City trying to fight a long war when they really should have been trying to fight a short war. And obviously France is humongous. Without the yeah. French, uh, right now we're, you know, drinking black girl tea oh, no. biscuits or something like that. So that's the American Revolution, guys. I think that we did it justice. Why don't you leave your comments down below? What do you think about it? What do you think we missed? What do you think we got right? What do you think needs to be discussed more? So giddy up for the learning, guys. If you haven't subscribed to Hip Hughes History, you can do that very simply by pressing that big red button. What's up to the internet? So don't be subscribed free. Where tension goes, energy flows, guys. We'll see you next time that you press my buttons.